My name is Ivan Novik, and I'm going to lead you through this tutorial session called Green Plum Tutorial for Beginners. So let's start out. What is Green Plum? What can it do? And why is it interesting to people? Green Plum is a database. Green Plum is a database that's optimized for very large data sets. It allows companies, governments, groups, organizations to put hundreds of terabytes, petabytes of data into this very large scale system, which can then be used to write interactive and uh, queries to, to analyze what's in your data. So imagine you work for a retail store and you have thousands of branches. Within each branch, you're selling hundreds of thousands of products and you have millions of people coming into your store every day. So what you wanna do is have a record of every purchase by every person in every store from the beginning of the creation of your company until today. And then you want to be able to ask questions about this data. Like, what is the correlation of uh, product sales when two products are sitting close, close in distance from each other on the shelf? What is the seasonal trends in the purchases of products um, when they're associated with hot products and cold products? Do they buy more hot products in the winter and more cold in the summer? All of this and really anything that can be at the imagination of the user can be queried and analyzed when you accumulate large sets of data and have a platform that can be used to ask questions of that data. That's what Greenplum can provide. Greenplum leverages commodity hardware. You can use up to hundreds of Linux servers linked together through high-speed networks in order to create a, a massively parallel processing a system that is a in, in its entirety a database offering a database product that you can use to store and query your data so a little bit about Greenplum more it was created in 2005 it was created by the company Greenplum Incorporated it's now an open source project it has been open source since 2015 and it's based on the Postgres open source technology Postgres is a transactional database that's open source, well, Greenplum combines hundreds of Postgreses together to create a very large scale, massively parallel version of Postgres that can be used for use cases such as data warehousing, advanced data science, analytics, reporting, business reporting, business intelligence. And that's what Greenplum is. Talk about how to get Greenplum onto your system. So first, let's surf over to greenplum.org that's the domain, that's the website for the Greenplum database open source project. From here, in addition to tutorials and calendar, etc., you can download Greenplum. So if you click on over on the download link, it'll bring you over to this page. There's two primary download options for the Greenplum open source project. One is GitHub. The other is the Ubuntu personal package archive. So if you click over onto the GitHub link, that will take you to the source tarballs. You can download the source code of various versions of Greenplum, the, the different releases that came out. You can also navigate over to the code itself. You can browse the source code. You can make changes. You can check out branches, do whatever you want with the Greenplum source code and build it yourself. If you're looking for packaged binaries, then maybe the Ubuntu package is one that you would like. So it's completely free. It's a standard Ubuntu mechanism for distributing software. It's called the Personal Package Archive. Shows you very simplistically here what the steps are. Essentially, you run app get install, app get update, app get um, add repository, these kinds of instructions, which are very familiar for any Linux user who wants to add software to their system. And then within a few seconds, you've got Greenplum installed on your Ubuntu system, completely free. There's also a blog. If you go and search um, install Greenplum uh, Ubuntu, it'll come up as the first hit install Greenplum, and that'll walk you through a bit more of the setup steps. So go ahead and check out that link if you want to use the Ubuntu option. If you're a customer of Pivotal, you can go to the network.pivotal.io. From there, we have the Pivotal Greenplum distribution of Greenplum database. You can pick the version that you want, and it comes with the database server as well as a bunch of different packages and options like the Greenplum streaming server, 
the spark connector, things like that. So go ahead, if you're a Pivotal customer, and go to the Pivotal network and download Pivotal Green Plum from there. Now, let's say that you want another option. You want to leverage some, you want to leverage the cloud to get quick access to Green Plum and to a full Green Plum system. There are options ready to go on Amazon, Microsoft, and Google. I'm going to demo for you the Google option. So you go to the Google Cloud Marketplace. From there, I'm going to type in Green Plum. Search. Since I already have a license, I'm going to choose Pivotal Green Plum Bring Your Own License. That brings up the, the Launch Green Plum button. I click on the Launch uh, button. And then from there, it gives me a short menu of options. And in this menu of options, I pick, um, do I want to have Apache Madlib? Do I want to have R? Do I want to have geospatial analytics, data science packages? I'm just going to pick all the defaults and hit deploy. Once this gets going, it'll be about two or three minutes. And once the um, system is deployed, then you can get access to the shell. You can get access to the command center and you can start using Greenplum. I'd also like to point out how to get access to the documentation. We've had extensive and highly detailed documentation for Greenplum since back in 2007, almost 12 years, and continue to have um, really good, really helpful documentation. So first option is go to docs.greenplum.org, docs.greenplum.org. From there, you can see there is an administrator guide some basic concepts, managing a green plum, defining database objects, talking about distribution and SKU, about this is more about your schema design, how to insert, update, delete data, querying data, working with external data, so data not stored natively in the database, but data that's external that you want to query through the green plum engine, loading and unloading, manage and managing performance. There's also a security configuration guide, a best practices guide, utilities guide. Utilities guide lists out many of the, the utilities you can run, GP config, GP expand, GP SSH, and then as well, reference guide. Reference guide can, shows you all of the uh, system settings that are available, a lot of information about the extensions, the data types, and um, documentation about the extension framework. So if you want to have access to Hadoop or access to S3 or third-party external systems that can be done through the extension framework. Um, there's also the Pivotal documentation, which is freely available. So it's on gpdb.docs.pivotal.io. Tends to be a little bit more comprehensive. So from there, you can see installing Greenplum. Make sure to check out the um, configuring your operating system settings. So if you're not using the cloud marketplace, if you're building your own system or you, you want to make sure to get the operating system configuration guide that's in here. Shows you what system settings to set on Linux. There's also very good release notes. So every release, it'll list out new features, resolved issues, very detailed and, and worth looking at, so as well as the um, supported platforms, supported platform notes. And then again, installing Greenplum database concepts, the, the system administration aspects, reference aspects, clients, loaders, connectors, and then ODBC, JDBC, um, and as well, the Pivotal Greenplum Command Center and Pivotal GP Text. So very thorough documentation, highly encouraged to go and, and read through and, and use the documentation as a beginner to Greenplum. All right, let's move on to the Greenplum architecture and get into the internals and usage of Greenplum. So this is a layout of the a block diagram of the Greenplum analytics platform. So you can see here at the top are the different types of applications that can interface with Greenplum. It's your SQL applications, your BI and reporting, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and other custom applications. They connect into Greenplum through standard APIs like the JDBC, ODBC connection, ANSI SQL, and then also through programmatic languages like Python, R, Java, Perl, and C, 
and some other advanced modules like PostGIS for geospatial, etc. Internally, you can see some of the major components of GreenPlum, the PostgreSQL core kernel, the command center for interfacing with the system, the storage layer, workload management, query optimization, massively parallel processing, and then the different types of data that can be stored and accessed through GreenPlum include both the internal data, which would be primarily structured data and semi-structured data, and then as well your uh, unstructured data such as JSON or semi-structured data such as JSON and your other unstructured text data and your external data like Avro, Parquet, XML. So really this lays out the idea that you can run many different types of applications through many interfaces against a scalable compute platform which is based on the Postgres kernel. Um, looking at the architecture of the actual engine itself, you can see it's a scale-out MPP system, massively parallel processing system. So typical GreenPlum systems will run anywhere from four to 400 full Linux servers. Um, and each of those will be running multiple Postgres kernels on each server. These are all connected through a high-speed network, so, you know, high-speed ethernet uh, over the GreenPlum interconnect software layer, which goes over standard TCP and UDP over IP. And then connections are managed through the master servers, and, which are two master and standby server. When queries come into the database, the first thing that happens is the queries are parsed. And then after they are parsed, they go into the query optimizer. Query optimizer needs to convert a SQL code into an actual execution plan that can access the data where it lives on a wide ranging cluster and can efficiently, efficiently process it. So this is quite similar to any relational database, except for the fact that it is parallel in nature and that it knows how to create query plans that leverage the full uh, power of a multi-server cluster and to minimize the network traffic and maximize the uh, local computing that can be done. The, as data is processed through, the, through queries, it starts at the lowest layer, which is reading the data from disk, and then it's fed through a dynamic pipelining, which allows for the rows to be fed up through the query plan and processed as they come off of disk into the upper parts of the query plan and then are eventually returned back to the user. So this allows for a very fast query execution and uh, ability to scan large amounts of data, process it, and return aggregate results back to users. So clients connect into the master host. The um, query is then parsed. It, after it is parsed, it is sent to the query optimizer. The query optimizer will generate a physical execution plan. It is then dispatched through the query dispatcher module in the master, which will send the required execution plan to the remote machines. From there, it's executed in parallel across the entire cluster, and it includes distributed transaction management. So as queries are being processed, GreenPlum is a transaction safe asset database so it takes into account transactions, I, transaction IDs and visibility of data. And then quer queries are then returned back to the, to the user. Uh, from a point of view of high availability, all data has at least two, co has two copies. So, and those two copies are spread between multiple servers in the system. So if any one server dies or becomes temporarily unavailable, queries can continue to process live uh, with no uh, downtime. So essentially the way this works is you have uh, for every portion of the data that is stored in a, let's say in a Postgres kernel, there's also a mirror Postgres kernel that's on a remote machine and it uses synchronous replication to ensure that at the time of commit all data is safe on both the both two copies of the data. Okay. Let's look at interfacing to the GreenPlum database through the data definition language. So this is how you create your schema, create your structures. Um, so essentially, the 
Grand Plum system, very much like the Postgres system, uh, is broken up into databases within the system. So you can use the command create database, drop database. This allows you to create a environment that you can create schemas and tables. This is your first level of separation. So you can have multiple databases within a Green Plum system. A schema is more of a logical organization. Uh, it, has, it has an easier ability to share data to multiple schemas within the same database uh, based on the permissions that are granted by the DBA. But the schema is used to create logical organization and storage quotas for different uh, usages inside the, a given database. You also have something called a search path, which allows you to seamlessly interact with the DB and based on your search path, it will look for the objects you're referring to in the path that, of the schema, the schemas that are normally used. Some of the core limits to the system, so database size is unlimited in practice, and that goes into hundreds of servers and many petabytes of data. Tables themselves are, are practically unlimited in size. Rows can go up to 1,600 columns. Uh, an individual field, which is one row, one column, can be up to one gigabyte. And then, um, let's see what else is interesting here. Uh, table name length does have a 63-byte limit. So these are just some of the basic limitations in Greenplum. Uh, there are three special databases in Greenplum. One is called template zero, template one, and Postgres. These, as the name template infers, are used when, data, when creating other databases. So they are, in fact, um, copied when the user or the DBA is creating a new database. So template zero um, should not be altered and for the most part is not used by users. It can be used, as it's mentioned here, to recreate template one in certain cases, but for the most part, when you say create database, it'll take a copy of template one and then form that new database for you based on that. So if there, the DBA wants to create some sort of patterns in terms of what's usually available, they can create it in the template database. And then when running create database, it will automatically be there. And then the Postgres database is there for utility functions, for DBAs to log into a database. They know that the Postgres database is always there and they can use it for DBA work. When you create a table in Greenplum, you have several options. Now these options refer to how you can store the data, how the data, how the data is stored in Greenplum. And these selections can have a, a, wide, a, a very large impact in both uh, storage utilization and performance of your system. So it's really important to know the different options you have when storing data in Greenplum. The first option is heap storage. Heap storage is the traditional uh, storage type that came in the Postgres database. It's ideal for OLTP workloads or OLTP similar workloads where you're doing frequent updates and deletes. It is not a compressed data store, so it's not ideal for very large data sets. But if you're doing frequent updates and deletes in more of a OLTP type scenario, then heap is what you would want to use. Then in the category of append optimized, there are a few different formats. So if you're not going to be doing frequent updates and deletes and you have a, a larger data set or you have a traditional data warehouse with uh, large fact tables, then you would normally store those in append optimized. The reason they're append optimized and not append only is that even for historical data sets, data correction is frequently uh, required. So it's necessary to have the ability to update and delete, but the performance is optimized for appending and adding data, not for constant updates and deletes to the data. Now, once you've chosen append optimized for your very large tables, the next question you want to ask is, should I store it in a row format or a column format? Column format can compress better. So if you have, for example, a column called country, and many of the rows will have similar countries. And if you were to compress that data, then all, for example, the data from China, it would be a repeated text, China, China, China. It would compress really well in a column storage. Um, also, if you have a thousand columns and you're frequently querying only three columns, then using a column store will allow you to bypass the majority of the columns and access the data you're interested in. On the other hand, if you are frequently querying select star and trying to assemble the entire full row, then 
storing it in the row format will be more efficient to retrieve those rows and get them back for computation. So you can pick between row and column storage. And then the next thing you'll want to think about is, is whether and how much to compress the data. So if you, want to, if you need to save si space, and if you have a very large data set, then compression is highly recommended. You can compress at the table level or at the column level. If you have a column, uh, column storage table, you can compress only certain columns. But if it's a row, stored, row format storage, then you can compress the entire table. And you can choose between QuickLZ in the Pivotal Green Plum, um, and in the open source you have LibZ and Z Standard. Z Standard is the newest, fastest open source algorithm and is highly recommended for optimal performance. Um, in addition to that, there is one other thing, which is the uh, row length encoding. Row length encoding, uh, maybe not part of the beginner's class, but you should take a look and see if you have some very repeating data sets, especially in a column store, like for example, stock ticker symbols, run length encoding can help you get a little extra boost, a, a big extra boost in compression as well. It's a little bit of a, a niche use case. Okay, let's talk about data distribution. So we talked about data storage in terms of your table type, but the next thing you want to consider when designing your schema is, is the distribution of your data across the system. So every table when you create it also has a distribution method. So you can select a column or a set of columns to be the distribution key. And then based on that column, the data will be divided between the cluster based on the, the column ID provided. You can also choose random distribution, which will give you a very even layout of the data. However, will be not ideal for joining because when joining, there'll be no structure to how the data is divided and won't be as fast to, to join. And as well in Greenplum 6, you have distributed uh, a replicated distribution, which means all rows are repeated and stored on every segment, which inversely to the randomly means that it's very fast for joining because all data is on every part of the cluster and can be quickly joined locally uh, with any other table. So for example here, when you have a order table and you can see that this is distributed by customer ID, what's happening is that the different orders are being stored on different parts of the cluster or different segments based on that customer ID. So when you select, when you did create table, you said distributed by customer ID that showed the system how to divide the data up into chunks and to store it throughout the cluster. So here's an example of a parallel data scan. We're saying select count star from orders where the orders are within a certain date range. So the query comes into the master. The plan is then sent out to the segments. The segments all are looking locally for any orders within those dates that match their local, their local system. And all, every segment in the system has some uh, part of the orders because those orders were distributed based on the, either the order ID or the customer ID or whatever the table creation uh, had. And then finally, the results are aggregated on the master and given back to the user. Now, again, looking at distributed randomly, so the data is distributed across all segments. There's not much skew. Skew means uneven distribution. So you've got a very even distribution of data but anytime you want to join to that table, you don't know where the different rows are. So it'll have to be a full data motion to do an efficient joining of that, that data set. When you distribute by a specific column name, this allows you to, to know where the data is. And again, this is very good when you can distribute many tables by the same distribution key because it allow us to have similar data sets on the same portion, same segment of the cluster, which was gonna make joins quick. And I'm gonna have an example of that. Uh, and this, as I mentioned, distributed replicated, which means all the data is on every segment and it's fast to join because it's already there. So if you look at a case where you have a good distribution, you can see we're creating a table distributed by customer ID. Every color here is, is a one of the buckets, the data buckets, and you can see that the data is evenly divided 
to all the segments in the system. There's not any skew or unevenness, and you've got equal processing that can be done on every segment. Now, a bad distribution. In this case, we're going to distribute by the column called is customer. So is customer could either be yes or no, right? You've got a person and you want to know, is it a customer or not already? So that's a, a, a Boolean or a yes or a no field in the database. Now that's going to have only one of two values. And when you store it, you could have hundreds of segments in the database, but only two, two valid values that get sent to the cluster. So you're going to have a very uneven distribution of data. Um, you can see here, when you go to all of the six segments in this cluster, although normally you'd have, let's say, 600 or quite a few segments, but in any case, having only two, you're just going to be busy on two of those segments with your, your processing, and, and it's going to be slow to query, much slower than if you had distributed on another column like the customer ID. You can also have something called processing skew. So if you were to segment, if you were to distribute the data based on month, in this case, so all of the data for January here, February, March, April on separate segments. And then if you ask a question like select where the date is February, then all of that processing will only happen for the February data because all the other months are not impacted by that query. The, the where clause was where February is the month. So that's what we call processing skew. And that's another uh, key point to watch out for in your schema design to ensure that you don't create a situation with your schema design that all the computation is happening on, on a small portion of the cluster. So when doing a join, here you've got a customer table and an invoice table, and we distribute the, ta the first uh, table by customer ID and the second table by customer ID. So both the customers and the invoices, both by customer ID. And you can see that the customer data is divided here and the invoice data is divided here, and the similar customer IDs are all stored on the same segment. So when you go and do the joining, you can see it's just doing local processing, and it can easily and quickly do that processing, so that's really good. What the replicated, distributed replicated, will do is, for example, it will store the whole customer table on every segment, which means that you can easily join to it in any case. All right, let's talk about indexes. So historically, indexes were not very popular in MPP or analytical databases. They're more popular in a transactional database because you were looking, like for example, for a specific customer ID and updating it or deleting it. But in Greenplum, we do have indexes. And in particular, we have B trees, we have bitmaps, we have GIST or GIST indexes and GIN or GIN indexes. These are all different types of ways to find data more efficiently than a sequential scan through the data. So a B-tree is your traditional database index. It's good for finding one in a million or one in a trillion items. Classic example would be you're, you're working for a shipping company like a parcel shipping post office and they say, find my tracking ID. So how do you go and find that one tracking ID? you need an index, right? Otherwise, you're gonna be looking through all the packages. Is this my ID? Is this my ID? Is this my ID? Very inefficient. So your B tree is for looking for specific kind of items in a table. Those are also called drill through queries um, or lookup queries where you have a, a dashboard or UI displaying the details of a specific record and then updating it. Bitmap indexes are a bit of a special case, not really suited for a beginner class, but at a high level, can accelerate certain workloads, especially when you create that index on a table that on a column that has only, let's say, less than 100 unique values, and you want to use that bitmap index to quickly eliminate and the the data set down to the if, when the where clause matches one of those unique values. The gist index is a, gen, a generalized index, but very popularly used with geospatial data. So if you're going to be doing bounding boxes of regions and you want to make it faster to look for locations based on geospatial data in the database. And finally, the GIN index is very popular for text data. It's, it's used in full text search, which is a feature of Greenplum 6, and it's used on JSON data as well. So it allows you to find portions of documents that match the search string that you're looking for. 
So that's a different kind of index based on text-based indexing and search. So these are all actually useful, but you don't need to create an index to make your traditional business intelligence and data warehousing analytical queries faster. Those you rely on the optimizer and the power of the MPP platform to compute as quickly as possible. Now, let's get into the partitioning of data. So we talked about distribution, and you could think of that as a horizontal spreading. And now we're going to talk about partitioning, which you could think of as a vertical spreading of the data. So the primary goal of table partitioning is to achieve part partition elimination and to allow the database to quickly bypass the large majority of the data that is in a table in order to answer a query. So for example, here, select something from sales where the month equals April 2007. I may have 100 months worth of data in my data warehouse. But if my where clause says where the month is April 2007, that's only one of the 100 months. In other words, that's 1% of the data that I care about. So by vertically partitioning the data by months, I will only be processing that month or 1% of the data, making my query 100 times faster than without partitioning. So you can really achieve 50, 100, 200, 500 times gains with the use of proper partitioning to your, to your query performance times. Again, the way to think of how to partition your data is to think of partition elimination. You want your partition key to match your where clause for your typical queries because you're going to be eliminating that data based on your where clause. So what is table partitioning? It logically divides a large table into smaller parts. It uh, facilitates database maintenance. So for example, we want to keep 100 months worth of data or days worth of data. You can easily drop the old days, old partitions, and bring in new partitions. We support both ranges of partitioning as well as lists, so lists of unique values, like for example, provinces in a country could be a list partition. So here again is another visualization. We have a sales table. We have multiple different partitions. In this case, again, it's months. It doesn't have to be months by any means. It doesn't even have to be time, although it's frequently based on time. Now, the, the key note here is it does benefit large fact tables more than small dimension tables. That's true. The bigger the data, the more data that you can eliminate, the faster and the more of a benefit you get from partitioning. In this particular example here, we have polymorphic partitioning. So in this case, we've got different storage types for every part of the, for the different partitions within the table. So we're storing row oriented for our near term data, column oriented for our longer term data, which, which has its better attributes depending on um, the, the, the common usage patterns. And then we actually use external par partitions for the very old data where we're storing it in HDFS or S3. You can still seamlessly query the sales table. And then depending on your query, depending on your where clause, it will only fetch the data from the storage type where the data lives. So this talks about partitioning and storage policy. So frequently your, your current data, your, your recent data would be heap tables, which makes it easy to update. Your, your then next range of data is likely to be row-based, but with compression, make it uh, easier to, to store, but still keep it fast to query based on rows. As you go back in time, you'd start moving to column level storage, which is compressing better, and then adding higher compression levels and eventually external storage, which would be the slowest to access, but the cheapest to store. When do you partition your data? Start with your huge tables. Think about what are my five biggest tables? What are my tables that store terabytes of data, petabytes of data? Partition those. Um, if you have a time-based, if you have ranges of data where every day you're getting a new set of events, like an event stream, those are perfect, um, perfect examples, perfect patterns for partitioning of data. Now, combining partitions and distribution, you can see here that this example has data partitioned based on time, but distributed based on order ID. So when we say select count star from orders, 
where the order date is something, what's happening is that the orders are evenly divided across the segments, but then within each segment, they're again sliced up. You can see these different partitions, which is different than here. So you're first dividing the data based on the distribution policy, then slicing it up based on the partitions. That means if I'm only looking for one partition, then I'm only gonna read this gray, this gray bit and ignore all these green, these green slivers of data. But that's happening in parallel across hundreds of segments. So you get the multiplicative effect of parallel processing and data elimination locally through partitioning, which gives you dramatically improved speed of execution. Continue on with data loading and unloading from Greenplum. There are several different methods you can use to get data in and out of Greenplum. They vary quite a bit in performance and in the use case that you would use them for. So for example, you can connect through standard protocols like ODBC and JDBC. You can use the, um, and use insert statements. Insert statements can directly load data into the database. You can also use the copy statement. The copy statement is faster than the insert statements because it is optimized for bulk loading into Postgres. Uh, since Greenplum is an MPP version of Postgres, it also works. We support the copy syntax. So you can see here that instead of, for example, um, it's listed here in this performance test one row a second, although I think those numbers are a bit out of date, um, that it is 300 times faster to run the copy command. So it's much faster to load data. However, even much faster than copy, several orders of magnitude faster would be to run GP load. GP load will leverage the parallelism of Greenplum and the copy uh, bulk loading capability of Postgres in order to achieve terabyte scale data loading. So the way it works is that with GP load is that the data is directly pushed from the staging machines to the individual uh, segments of the cluster in parallel. So you really can be loading tens of terabytes of an hour, uh, per hour into a database. It, it actually scales based on the size of your cluster. So the more system, the more segment servers you have, the more parallelism you have, the more hardware you have, the faster you can load data if you use this parallel GP load technique. You can also do loading from within the database to other tables. So for example, if you got the data into the database, now you wanna transform it and load it into other tables, then it's all internal movement within the cluster and that'll be even faster than GP load. So these are your different mechanisms for pushing data into tables in Greenplum. Listed out here, some of the, synt the syntax, so you say insert into and then values versus copy and then delimited data. If you have an external table, you say insert into, um, and then you can um, select data from an external table and insert into a local table. Or GP load, you just run the GP load command using a configuration file and directly pump the data into the segments of the, of the system. This is uh, unloading options. So you can do again, copy from, and copy from will be one way to get data out, but if you use external writable tables, it'll be much faster than using the copy command. The reason is, is that it can use the parallelism of the segment servers of Greenplum to extract the data from the database. You can also run GP backup. GP backup will dump all the data in parallel to backup files. Okay, let's talk about hardware recommendations for running Greenplum. So there are many different environments and platforms the common factors are Greenplum runs on the Linux operating system. Greenplum assumes a TCP IP network. It's a commodity-based system. So if you're running Linux, if, you're, if you have a cluster of, of Linux systems, they could be VMs, they could be physical hardware, they could be Docker containers. The key point is that you've got Linux machines Linux systems and you've got a high-speed interconnect and you've got a lot of high-speed fast storage to feed the data for processing. 
So some people say, hey, Ivan, um, Greenplum depends on this really high speed uh, hardware in order to perform. You know, why don't you make a database that performs with less good hardware? Well, it's not that Greenplum depends on high speed hardware, it's that high speed hardware makes data processing faster. Greenplum is just the vehicle that does the processing, but the faster your hardware, then the more you can process data. The faster your storage, the more you can get data from storage into the CPUs to do the calculations. So in practice, when building large scale data computing systems, you wanna achieve the sweet spot between mass production and high end. Think of premium economy on the airplane. You don't wanna be on the cheapest seats, but you don't wanna waste money on first class when there's reasonably good seats elsewhere. So what you're looking for is those traditionally those two socket and four socket servers with maximum number of cores um, with a clock, the highest clock rate you can get before prices start to increase disproportionately to the clock rate. Then with RAM, generally more RAM is better. These days, average servers are coming with close to a terabyte of RAM. There's not, there's not a great benefit in being cheap on RAM. RAM is, is useful for many tasks. It is the working space for data computation. The more working space you have, the more things you can turn through, the more different concurrent tasks you can handle. So memory is important. Please get as much memory as you can for, afford for your system in order to have a high performing hardware environment for data calculations. Also, please get as much disk throughput as you can get. We don't think about IOPS when you're thinking about data analytics and data warehousing. You're thinking about data throughput. So when someone tells you a storage system has a million IOPS a second, a million IOPS, IOPS, IO operations per second say, that's cool, but how much throughput? You want to be getting, um, if, we're, if you're running a, a typical system, you wanna be seeing at least 50 gigabytes a second uh, on, a, on a system, on a cluster. A high, a very large system that had hundreds of servers and had high speed, uh, you know, 40 gigabytes per second of, of throughput, you could be getting in total 400, you could be getting one terabyte per second of throughput. Imagine that one terabyte of data being fed into your CPUs every second. The more throughput you can get, the more data you can process at the same time. Um, and then the network. So the network, there's not many choices. You're primarily going to be looking at Ethernet and you wanna look for at the minimum 10 gig, but ideally these days 25, 40, or 100 gig networks. So this is really independent of whether you deploy in the cloud, you deploy on premise, or you deploy in your brother's data center. The point is, is that all of these things are Linux servers. Whether you're running in Amazon, AKA the cloud, or if you're running in IBM's data center, kind of the cloud, or you're running in your own data center, the private cloud, these are brand names, brand names for the same fundamental core capabilities, which are x86 processors running on Linux servers on a high speed network connected to very fast storage. That's what you need to compute and, and analyze lots of data. So that's, that's how to think about this. Let's talk about disaster recovery. So we talked that Greenplum has internal high availability and mirroring. So if single machines fail, you do not lose your data. You do not go down. But what if the entire data center fails? There are a few strategies to deal with this when working with Greenplum. The first strategy is dual load, active, active. So imagine you have one data center in city one, another data center in city two. What you do is when you're ingesting new data, you ingest it in both places. You do the processing identically in both through your QA tested processing routines. So for example, let's say that I'm running that huge retail store chain and every, every minute or every day I'm getting additional transaction data. That data can be fed to both data centers, to both Greenplum clusters in parallel. And then they can be processed and transformed and curated in, 
at the same time and in the same way on both clusters. What this provides you for is active active. It requires more work on your side because the ETL developer needs to ensure the data is the same. But what it gives you is twice the production throughput, price to pr production workload capability, and almost zero downtime in the case of a full data center failure. This is probably the most advanced option and the most performant option, the most potentially cost effective option, pretty much all around best option if it can be accomplished. However, it is not easy from the ETL and the developer point of view to ensure consistency between multiple clusters when doing dual load. Due to that, uh, let's say coding and ETL difficulty, people look at other options. Uh, another, uh, however, many people, many successful companies do use dual load. Option number two is replicated backup. So what you do is you have two clusters and you take backups of the cluster. You then replicate your backup uh, to the second data center and load that data into the second cluster, making the full system available in a second data center and a second site. If site one goes down, you have site two available with the backup data and it can be used as your new production cluster. This has more potential downtime in between the failover than dual load active active. However, it is a viable um, disaster recovery and disaster prevention approach. It has been used by many, many people for many, many years and is a viable solution. Um, if you're doing it in the cloud, you have access to cloud snapshot backups and snapshots can be replicated to another data center. Option three is SAN mirroring. So in this case, you do not run on local storage, you run on a storage area network. The storage area network will then internally replicate itself to a second site, making the data available as it's being updated on the first site. This type of replication um, provides for a seamless experience for the application users because the second site will have all of the updates that were done on the first site. This requires using a SAN technology. SANs are more expensive than local disk. And so this solution is generally not preferred unless data sizes are small and unless budgets are high. If your data size is small, your budget is high and your concern for data loss is high, this is an excellent solution. The fourth solution is write ahead log replication. It is in the roadmap for Greenplum as of June 2019. It will be a future solution. See the disclaimer at the beginning of this deck about future looking statements. It is a, a future solution that's being developed on by the community. This will allow for a more traditional replication experience for people used to single traditional databases, uh, branded databases like, for example, Oracle Database. It's a replication solution and this will be available in Greenplum. It is more complicated than Greenplum due to the MPP nature of Greenplum. Therefore, it is not yet available, but will be available in about one year's time. Let's talk about maintenance tasks now. Every database needs maintenance and monitoring. So let's get into how to get started and get, us, get set up with maintenance and monitoring on a Greenplum system to be productive, be safe, and be effective. Let's start with Vacuum. You may or may not have heard of Vacuum before. Vacuum is a name of a utility in Greenplum and in Postgres, which it's derived from, which implies cleaning up the dirty stuff. Just like a vacuum, you go and clean up the dirt. So what is the dirt in a Postgres or a Greenplum database is the data which is marked as no longer useful or usable, but is still stored internally in the system. The reason there is such of a, of a data that is no longer used but still available is for performance. So when data is deleted or updated, it is not actually deleted or updated, it is only marked as dirty. When vacuum is run, it is then deleted from the system. Designs like this were made so that data could be inserted sequentially 
and could take advantage of the speed of I.O. that was available and that can uh, allow for efficient sequential I.O. writing while um, doing updates and deletes and not incurring uh, large amounts of random I.O. Into the, into the data system. This was a popular pattern for, for many years and is part of the infrastructure that Greenplum and Postgres are based on. So what this means in practice is that if you are operating a system that has many updates and deletes to data and tables and or metadata, then vacuum is required in a maintenance task in order to free up that space that's no longer used. As a side note, the Postgres and the Greenplum uh, community is working in the future on vacuum free storage models, which will be likely incorporated into the system in, in the distant future, I would say several years down the road. But this has been the mainstay for Postgres and Greenplum and other uh, similar technologies for many years and is today the current best practice. So here's a listing of some of the key maintenance activities. Firstly, vacuum of the catalog. The catalog is your metadata. There's a schema called um, PG something. That schema is the catalog schema, and it needs to be vacuumed. If you do not vacuum that schema, then what happens is that frequent um, creation of tables or updates of tables or changes to the metadata will incur um, dirty rows in the catalog tables. So what you can do is you can vacuum the entire schema for the catalog in one shot, and this can be done online as the database is being used, it can be done weekly, daily, or even hourly if you have a system with rapid DDL, rapid table creation. So vacuuming the catalog is an important task. You can also re-index the catalog. Re-indexing the catalog will recreate the structures of the indexes in the catalog tables. This will make them more efficient due to a system that has many changes, many updates and deletes in the catalog re-indexing will ensure that the indexes are clean and lined up without much dead space in them. So therefore doing this weekly is a good maintenance task, also a online task. Analyzing of the catalog. So analyze is another maintenance task. What it does is it collects statistics for the optimizer. It will check for common patterns in the data, row counts, most frequent values, things like this, and store those statistics in the PG statistic catalog table. So what this means, if you're doing frequent operations to create tables, delete tables, modifying table structures, then analyzing the catalog either weekly, daily, or even hourly will ensure that doing catalog queries will be as fast as possible due to having up-to-date statistics. Vacuum full. Vacuum full can be done on the catalog. That will be done during a maintenance window. It, it is not necessary to be done unless there you have not done vacuum catalog, the above command, and the many dead spaces accumulate in the catalog tables that can be seen through um, through catalog queries that will show the level of what we call bloat in the catalog. So if you have a lot of bloat and you have not been doing vacuum, you can take the system down for a maintenance window and do a vacuum full, and then that'll bring it back to a more maintainable state, and then hopefully you start doing vacuum of the catalog on a regular basis. Um, other key things to be done for a maintenance point of view are vacuuming your user tables. So when your user tables, not the catalog, but user tables are frequently updated or deleted, they should be vacuumed to ensure that you clean the dead space. After loading data into the table, you should be doing analyze of those tables. Any table that does not have statistics, then the optimizer will not create efficient query plans for them. So always analyze after loading large amounts of data to a user table. Looking for idle connections. If, if users are connecting to the DB and walking away, and if you have a population of thousands of users connecting and leaving that, it is possible to do a monitoring task and terminate idle connections that have been sitting there for a long time. 
those idle connections do take up some resources on the server. And so it's good to ensure that people are not connecting for long durations. There are features in Greenplum and in Postgres that can do this automatically, but if you don't enable those, you can also do it manually and terminate those idle connections. Three more items. One is making sure to do archiving of your log files, move them off to the side, keep them for historical purposes, keep them for analyzing errors. A hardware alerting, you're running on hardware of one form or another. Be sure to have alerting in place. If memory components are failing, if drive components are failing, if network components are failing, it's important to get alerts back into the administration administrators and to take action to bring those servers out of the cycle and to get them maintained. And lastly, segment status check. There are listings of these queries that can be done in the documentation. There are things checking for the uh, how many of the segment servers are up, how many are down, how many are in their primary roles. So these types of segment checks can be done on a frequent basis and alerts can be sent out if servers are down or if the database is still running, but it's running in a, let's say, degraded state because some of the servers are not active. So this gives you a summary of the usual and regular maintenance tasks that you would run in a Green Plum database. This is, doesn't sound like the fun part. And in fact, you know, maintenance and cleanup activities never are the fun bit, but making sure you have, you have your house clean ensures everybody can enjoy the system and can make good use of it. So. It's important to know what the normal maintenance activities are and to have database administrators to schedule these tasks and to make sure they're being done. Part of the security system of Greenplum, there is a system of users, roles, and groups. This enables role-based access to data. In other words, as an administrator, you can set which people are logged into the database as which role and as what user and within what group and you can define access to data based on your policies and permissions. Let's see how that works. So, as we discussed before, there are, this is an example image of the EMC Green Plum system on the left, but in this picture above, you see there are different databases and different schemas. We also have users and groups. So, in Green Plum, there are there is a concept of a role. A role can be either directly used as a username. It could be something like a login role. So that means you can log in under that role and that's who you are. Or a role can be something that's inherited by other roles, other login roles or, or groups. And that, that's more of what you would think of as a group. So for example, you could have a role called um, data scientist, and then you can have other roles called Mike, Tom, and Jerry. Mike, Tom, and Jerry could be login roles, and they could all be data scientists. So the way that works is that you create those roles as Mike, Tom, and Jerry, and then you add them uh, to the role of data scientist. That way you can create permissions and settings for them as a, at the group level. This is not related, as it mentioned, to the OS users and groups. This is at the database level. So OS is for logging in through SSH to the Linux machines, but these roles that we're referring to here are roles in the database system. Let's see. So how do you differentiate a user account from a group? They're both under, underneath the covers, they're both roles. But if you can log in to the system, then it is a user account. Here are some of the attributes and default attributes for a role. So there are, there's a concept of super user or no super user. There is a permissions to create databases or not create databases, create other roles or not create other roles. Or there's something explicitly which is no login, meaning this is not a login role. So here's some syntax examples. You can say create role or alter role. So create role John with login, and then it says add it to this resource queue. Ignore that for the moment. You can also say alter role John with create DB. That means have the ability to give a new setting to the 
role, which means that role John can now create databases in the system. So through this, through this um, commands, you can create roles which are able to log into the database as a user. You can also create other roles which are inherited and used as uh, common groups that you can put people into. Here's more information about the groups. As I mentioned, it's done through inheriting the capabilities of the parent role. But let's get right to the syntax. Let's get right to the examples. Create role grp underscore admin. This role has the ability to create other roles and to create databases. We then grant this role to John and Sally. That means John and Sally are not now also inheriting and part of the GRP admin or group admin. That we then revoke admin from Bob. So what this showing is that you can create these um, groups through the expression of roles and that these groups can be granted and revoked from certain users. That's the syntax used to add a user to a group or remove them from a group. And then later on, you can give permissions to certain objects and certain capabilities in the database to either the individual users or to a group of users. Now, how to define who can connect to the database is an additional layer of security. So before you even get into the system and determine access to the database, the Greenplum database itself, that is administered through the PG underscore HBA configuration. It's host-based authentication. So there's a whole number of settings and parameters here inherited from the Postgres database and practically identical to the Postgres database which allow for the management of authentication into the system. So this is a text file that's on the server in the data directory and the configuration directory of the database. And there's an environment variable in Greenplum called master data directory. I'll show you that when we log into the demo system later in this tutorial. You can put comments in, but then the lines are read line by line. And the first match is found when trying to connect to the database. Let's see if we have an example here. Well, we don't, but what we do have is some of the detailed authentication methods. So the types of authentication you can use are, for example, trust. So trust means you're granted access immediately. This would be for development or testing, or it could be if you're already logged into, uh, no, for the most part, trust should not be, should not be used, I would say. Um, Let's move on to the next one. Reject, that's not commonly used. MD5, MD5 means there is a password. So you can set password access for certain users, um, but they are hashed. Password would be a plain text password. You can also defer authentication to an LDAP system or to a Kerberos system through GSS. Those are highly recommended for real world scenarios. PAM is also an, op an option. That's pluggable authentication method. There are many options and, and capabilities of PAM, but it's also quite complex. And I would say less frequently used than either LDAP or GSS uh, Kerberos authentication. So we talked about access, we talked about roles and groups. Let's talk about object privileges. Each, each object, whether it be a table or a schema or a view, it has an owner. Generic, generally the person who created it. Anybody except the owner must be granted privilege if they want access to it. You can grant privilege to public. That means that anyone can access it. Generally speaking, um, you should be cautious granting something to public. Grant and revoke are the way you add and remove permissions from an object. Here are some examples. Grant all on database, my database, to admin with the grant option. Grant select on table my table to public. That means anybody can query this table. Revoke insert update, meaning insert or update on table, my table from Sally. So Sally can no longer insert or update. Reassign owned by Sally to John. Drop owned by visitor. So these are different options, but you can read in the manual all the different options of ways 
to do role-based authentication for all the different objects in the database, but you have very fine-grained control over them. Let's get into workload management, which, is, which does dovetail from user management quite nicely. So in a, in a system, there are different levels of where you can control the workloads into a system. How do we define workload? Well, this is an engine. It's a database and analytical engine, and it needs to run work to be useful. It's going to run all of this heavy work, but we don't want that work to be done ad hoc, sporadically, on, without any prioritization. It needs to be prioritized for the purpose of its owner to achieve results. Given many people within an organization who have a need or a desire or business case for accessing data and compute resources. However, those needs are not all equal. They must be controlled and allocated due to priorities and due to requirements. So let's look at the different levels, starting with connecting into the database. So we want to control how many people can connect at once, how much resources are there. We provide both PG Bouncer and um, through the open source network, something called Heimdall. This allows us to, there are different connection, connection poolers. These are different connection poolers that have different capabilities. And these allow you to manage and control access into the system before it even enters. The next level would be your, your resource groups. Your resource groups are allocated to control different workloads. So let's say you have a ETL workload, a data science workload, an ad hoc workload, a critical business report workload, a experimental machine learning workload. These workloads should be given a certain amount of resources. We do that through resource groups and we identify which group they're in based on their username. So the user is mapped to a group and then that group is mapped to a workload which is mapped to a certain amount of resources which are allocated to those queries. So we can very easily say Give a, a CP, give a sandbox environment, say, you're going to get 5% of the system for your machine learning testing. However, if the system has some free cycles, you can use them. But if the system is busy with other critical workloads, you will be capped at 5%. This is dynamic query prioritization, and it can be controlled as well through changing settings at runtime. So by controlling the connections, by controlling the CPU and the memory, allocated to the different workloads, you can prioritize and have an orderly system with hundreds of users or thousands of users running hundreds of parallel queries and it, having all users meet their business requirements. And that's the goal that we have. Digging a bit more into the resource groups, this is how they are implemented. They're implementing implemented using Linux C groups. Linux C groups are a kernel level capability that allow us to create policies that, that jail certain processes at certain levels of resources and allow them to dynamically burst and dynamically shrink based on competing policies. So this allows us to pass through to the Linux kernel the controlling and monitoring and scheduling of all the processes on the system in a fashion uh, according to your business requirements and to the policies that you create. Some settings that are available in the resource groups include the concurrency level, so the number of concurrent queries running in that workload. We can say, for example, in this machine learning workload, do not allow more than 10 queries at once. Or in this, ET, in this business uh, intelligence reporting work lab do not allow more than 100 queries at once. Whatever limit you set to, that's your concurrency limit, and the rest of the queries will be queued and enter as a space in the queue becomes available. CPU rate limit targets the maximum CPU percentage given to this workload during busy times. So you're allowed to burst, but if the system is busy, you'll be throttled to this percentage of CPU on the system. The memory settings, limit shared quota and spill ratio, allow us to configure the amount of memory allocated to the workload and to divide the memory up in the system. Memory is not as elastic 
as CPU cycles because once that memory is taken, it is difficult to take it back. So these memory settings allow you to divide up the available memory on the system and to apportion it to different workloads um, that are coming into the system. See the note on hardware recommendations. It is recommended to take advantage of the trends and get large amount of memory as possible just to make for smooth sailing and easy operation. If you have a large amount of memory, you can run a lot of concurrent workloads at the same time. I've certainly seen hundreds and hundreds of concurrent, active, intense queries running and certainly seen thousands of users connected to the system and running workloads together. So take advantage of these settings, take advantage of the resource groups and take advantage of the connection pooling to set up a full stack of workload management in your system and to have an orderly set of processes and workloads running through your system to get the most advantage of your, of your Green Plum database. Let's walk through what transactions are and how transactions are handled in Green Plum database. Green Plum is a relational database system. It's a ACID system, meaning that it is always in a consistent state. Even in the event of query failure, in the event of host failure, in the event of software failure, it is a transactionally consistent and atomic operation database, guaranteeing the results in the database are accurate and correct at all times. This is similar to, to all relational database, traditional relational database systems. What's unique about this for Greenplum is that it is a MPP system uh, in which it's much less common to offer full transactionality in a relational database. So let's get into the details a bit. Transactions bundle multiple statements into all or nothing operation. So when you begin a transaction, either they're all committed or they're all rolled back. This allows you to do the traditional example, like remove money from one account and add it to another account for a money transfer. You don't want to do part, portion of the uh, transact portion of the operations and not all of them. So, but this could be any set of business rules or any set of operations that need to either all happen or not happen at all. That's what a transaction is. So the way you accomplish that is you begin or start a transaction. You run all of your SQL, your, your commands and operations, and at the end, you either end or commit that transaction to make it take effect in the system. You can also, during the transaction processing, issue a rollback statement, which forces the, all the commands to, as if they never happened, and to go away. By default, the database will operate in auto commit mode. So that means every statement is an implicit transaction and will be committed upon the end of the statement. So if you don't begin the transaction, transaction explicitly or indicate start transaction, it will be a single statement transaction. So you, um, you, will, you should be aware of that and you should create multiple statement transactions by uh, explicitly saying begin or start transaction, or you can disable auto commit mode and have it be implicitly in a transaction, which I think is less obvious and maybe not best practice. So transactions are actually what make the implementation of databases more difficult. If it wasn't for transactions, if it wasn't for concurrency, a group of four software engineers could probably build a database in one to two years. But when you introduce concurrency and transactions to a system, that's when it becomes much more complex and becomes often decade-long projects to, to build the perfect database. So let's look at this example. Transaction 1 starts. It has its own view of the database. Then transaction 2 starts. Transaction 2 changes a row in the table and transaction 2 commits its change. However, transaction 1 still needs its old value because this value was valid at the start of the transaction. This, um, this is a high-level example, and just 
kind of indicates the types of problems that we're dealing with here, but we're going to get more into the details now. Um, the way that this is managed in Greenplum is with multi-version concurrency control. So internally, we store the state of the system at multiple points in time. And when you execute a query, your query is executing as of a certain transaction ID or as of a certain time, and we'll see the view of the data as of that point in time. The disadvantage of this is that means that more storage is required to store these different um, uh, points in time and these different records of what, what the state was when. And that um, requires maintenance commands such as vacuum to, to be used as discussed earlier in this tutorial to, to clean up some of that old state from in a periodic basis. So there is complexity introduced with this uh, multi-version concurrency control, control, but it's extremely uh, performant, extremely effective, extremely accurate, which is why it's used. So it gives you that, that, that combination of performance, accuracy, and, and reliability. And, and those things are, are extremely valuable, which allows us to be okay putting up with some periodic maintenance work to maintain such a system. That being said, um, there are thoughts and ideas of how to take it to the next level um, if you Google in terms of things like um, non-vacuuming Postgres storage types, um, there are things being developed and, and we will see how that plays out in the future. So in general for relational databases there are four different transaction levels and this was defined long ago. You could read about this in uh, books by Jim Gray or in SQL, SQL uh, database textbooks. Um, but here are four uh, different isolation levels that databases can, can leverage. Read uncommitted, read committed, repeatable read, or serializable. So just at a high level you can think read committed means that until that change is committed, um, you, you cannot see it. Read uncommitted means that changes in a transaction are visible from outside. Repeatable read means that when you start the transaction, if you do a select, you will continue to see that same data in your transaction, in your own view of the data until that transaction ends. And serializable is fully encapsulated. So in Greenplum, we only support two of these generic database conceptual modes. The two we support are read committed and serializable. And the default is read committed and that's what's used for the most part. The differences between read committed and serializable, in the case of read committed, as it says here, um, each data was visible before the query start is also visible inside of the transaction. Uh, with serializable, only data which was visible at the start of the transaction is visible inside the transaction. So the takeaway here really is that you can't, that we do have a robust and sophisticated transaction system. We do have a robust and sophisticated multi-version concurrency control system, which allows you to do concurrent operations of updates and deletes, and at the same time running hundreds of parallel queries, and you're guaranteed to see predictable results based on 50 years of academic research into database and what the conceptual idea of the correct results are, which is well documented in literature and implemented in Greenplum. So these concepts like read committed are faithfully implemented and can be used by businesses to, to produce predictable results based on this uh, conceptual models, which are well established in the industry and, and extremely valuable. And, and to, to add for a bit of promotional marketing for big data SQL databases, I think the amount of research and work that has gone into database research is very valuable. And when people come and say, now we're gonna focus on NoSQL or relational databases are the problem, I think they're throwing away these years of research and concepts which have been created to, to store and collect data and to 
provide concurrent access to it in consistent and, um, and intelligent ways. So you can really use GreenPlum as a real database. I'm not even going to go into this bit. So if you're really interested in different levels of isolation, I would highly recommend you to pick up a book called, um, I believe it's called Transaction Management or Transactions, written by Jim Gray. And then you'll get into the, really the conceptual details of how database systems work internally. But the point here is that GreenPlum works like a normal database, as you'd expect in a read committed mode. Again, I'm just going to skip all this. So we'll move on now to the demo and show you what it's like to actually log into a GreenPlum system and start querying it. This I'm just flashing for fun. So let's move on now. Now let's get started on the demo. So here is our Google Cloud platform. And you can see here that we have deployed a GreenPlum cluster on the Google Cloud platform. And so what I'm going to do is uh, I have a little script here of what I'm going to show you. So the first thing is to log into the terminal. So this is a really cool thing about the Google Cloud Platform is if you love your terminal, you love your VI, your Emacs, and that's the only way you like to work without GUIs, then you're going to love this. So basically, right out of creation of this marketplace, I can just copy and paste this G Cloud syntax. And fair warning, I pre-installed gcloud, but in any case, it's just a software install. So now I just gcloud connect, and there you go, voila, I am connected to the system, right? So I can see uname, it's a Linux machine. Um, I can see it is a Red Hat or CentOS 7.6 7 operating system. I can run top see what's there. Um, nothing particularly special. So let's try the psql command, psql minus l. So there you go. We have a database here, a GreenPlum database here. Let's run uh, gp ssh minus, minus version. Okay, this is GreenPlum 5.17.0. Very recent GreenPlum version, that's awesome. We have a gpperfmon database, we have the template zero, template one, which we talked about. We have the Postgres database, which we talked about. Um, so psql minus l shows you the databases. Now, we also have um, uh, some environment variables, the master data directory. And then under here, you can see this base directory, that's where your actual data files are, don't go in there unless you, um, well, just don't go in there. Um, PGHBA we talked about, so the PGHBA file, that's where we set up our access control. So you can see here, let's see, as the user GP admin from all hosts, connecting to all databases on local host, then trust. So I talked before in the tutorial, um, don't use trust. I guess if you are using it only for localhost, it could be okay, um, it, but I would try to think about how to harden this as much as you can. So psql minus l, that gives me my list. Now let's try and connect in, I don't know, let's connect into gpperfmon and see what's going on there. So minus d, I mean backslash d, um, actually backslash question mark's a good one to know. That gives you all the help options that you can run from in this psql interactive terminal. Um, P sequel, I mean, sorry, backslash D, and then some other letter gives you all these different informational commands. So, for example, backslash D and then T, that lists out your tables. So, for example, there is a system history table. Let's query that. Select um, star from system history, and you can see some data. Now, this is not very um, readable, so I'm going to do extended mode which is backslash X and then select star from system history. What have I done wrong? Extended displays on, select star. Let's, let's see, I've made some mistake. Let's get out of that, go back in. 
select star from system history. There you go. So for example, this was a timestamp on this host. This was the memory used. This was the load average. So this gives you system resources. If I do a list of the tables again, I'm going to get rid of extended mode backslash X again, list of tables. Maybe I can try select star from database history and it has autocomplete. I press tab. So queries total, queries running, nothing's running, but this is how you basically interact with the database. So let's go back to our checklist for this tutorial. GP config. Okay, great. Important for beginners. So in the master data directory, there's another critical file called postgres.conf. So postgres.conf is where you have your DB settings. Um, these DB settings are um, global, they're called GUX, Global Uniform Configuration Variables. So we can use gpconfig. Now remember, Post G Greenplum is a MPP system. There are many Postgres instances. So what gpconfig does is, is it can read and update all of the postgresql.confs at the same time in a consistent fashion. So gpconfig, let's say for example, minus help and see what it has. There's a few nice examples. Like, so for example, list all parameters, gpconfig minus L. These are all things that you can set. For example, the PL Java statement cache size. You might want to set that if you're using PL Java. Um, I'm going to look at, let's see, some memory settings. Let's see, grep mem, maybe statement mem. Statement mem is the amount of memory allocated for a statement by default. So let's see, gpconfig minus s, and there you go, it's 125. All right, but what if we want to change it? So let's try changing it to 250. Successfully completed. Now here's a, here's a part, an unfortunate part about how this works. I'm going to run this command again, and what you're going to see is it hasn't changed. So what I can do, let's try GP stop minus help. I'm really showing you all of the nitty gritty here. Um, GP stop minus help, there's some, there's some ways to signal it. So minus U reloads the config files. So even though we updated the files, we have not signaled to reread the config file. So we will do minus U and then see that the statement mem has updated. So that, that's the quick tour of the GP config. Um, GP segment configuration. This is a catalog table. So let's log back in. Let's go into the Postgres DB. That's where we go to get a general look around. Remember, this is our database for DBAs to play around. And I'm going to show you the segment configuration table. So select. Let's first try to describe it. Describe GP segment config. Maybe configuration. Okay, so here's the table structure. First of all, it's in the schema PG catalog. That was the thing I called PG something, if you're paying attention to earlier in the tutorial. It's not PG something, it's PG underscore catalog. I couldn't remember at the time. PG catalog is the schema where all the catalog tables are stored. So in PG catalog dot GP segment configuration is the table and it has these columns. DBID, content, role, preferred role, mode, status, port, host name, address, and replication port. So if I say select star from GP configuration, GP segment configuration, there are three segments. There are three segments. They're all on the same host. They're all primary. So that's quite interesting. I did not set up. Um, I did not set up mirrors apparently on this host. I have a master, and I have two primary segments. Now, 
a normal production size workload, you would have hundreds of segments and hundreds of mirrors. But for this example, it's only primaries, which is just fine for a demo. The other key things you want to know is that if you had mirrors, this would be P or M. And if something, if a segment failed, then it would switch its role. So a mirror would become a primary, but you would still keep track of what the original role was for record keeping. S means it's in sync. Status means it's up. So if you see it's not in sync or it's not up, then you uh, know that you're in a degraded mode. And you should read about uh, recovering from uh, degraded mode in a, either in a, in a documentation or in a future tutorial. So this table is really important and one of the monitoring tasks that is normally recommended is to just log into the DB and query this table periodically and check how many of your segments are in their original mode, how many have failed, how many are in a degraded mode, and then you could take action accordingly. So this is, this is the segment configuration table. Um, Okay, the PG stat activity table. Select star from PG stat activity. This tells you what queries are running right now. So let's go to extended mode. And you could see, for example, the query I just ran. So it shows I'm running select star. Now this is a quick way to just see what queries are running. And in a data warehouse or an analytical database, queries can run a long time. So it's not a bad idea. You could just log in and run select star from PG stat activity, and you could see all the running queries. So that's a critical table. Another bonus critical table that you should be aware of is called PG class. PG class is the basic catalog table as part of PG catalog that stores all the objects. So if you hear the phrase rel name, rel name is the basically the table name. But there's also stuff like rel type somewhere. Rel type tells you, okay, this is a table, this is a, an index, this is a view. So everything is stored in PG class. So that's a good one to know about. For, for beginners, I'm just going to show you that it exists. You should be aware of it. You should know this is the source of truth, but we're not going to get into the details. Um, and then I guess it's not a bonus, it was scheduled. And last but not least, the command center. So if we go back to this UI, we use these syntaxes to get logged in. But you can also easily, I'm going to grab this GPCC password and username, click here, and within a quick second, I'm going to log in. And there's my command center. So you can get a quick look at it. You can, right now there's nothing running, but let's, let's make something run. Let's say select PG sleep 30. So there's a query running. Where is it? <clears throat> Some sort of uh, an issue there. Um, or maybe uh, this might not be our, I might not have enabled the real-time query display or some other configuration issue, but in the normal world, you would see the, the query running as I execute this query, um, or maybe it finished. Um, let's see, PG, I'm not gonna waste your time. So the point is, is this shows you're running queries. This is your full query monitor. Here you can see some more into it. Again, I'm not going to go through all the details, but I just want you to know that you can log right in to the command center from the marketplace by just clicking on the link. So the next thing we're going to do is do a little bit more of function programming. The next bit of the demo. So for this demo, um, now I'm going to show you how to write some functions in Greenplum. So one of the awesome and most powerful things of Greenplum is that it is extensible. It's extensible in many ways. You can create user-defined types. You can create user-defined functions. All, there's a variety of things. But from this beginner's tutorial, I just want to give you a taster. I'm going to show you two, two simple examples. One is 
using a language called PLPG SQL. So let's take a look at this PLPG SQL. This is taken. This example is taken from PostgresOnline.com. So I didn't write this. I just grabbed it from their website. But it works on Postgres. It works on Greenplum. So here I'm going to walk you through the syntax of what this is doing. Now this is a PLPG SQL function. You can see it down here is the name of the language. This is one of the languages. So this is basically how to take SQL code, but to create more of a procedural programming interface around it so that you can do for loops, you can have variables, you can do procedural coding on top of your SQL. This is very commonly used for utility purposes. So here we're going to say create or replace if it exists this function, some function name with two parameters. One is an integer, one is a text. The first one indicates how many times and the other is a message. This function returns a variable as a text variable. And then we're going to declare a variable here locally called string result as a text. We then begin the function. We create an, we initialize this variable to be empty. We check the parameter. If the num times parameter is 42, we change the result to write UR. If the num times is greater than zero and less than a hundred, we do a for loop. For one in number of times, we loop and we add this message to the string. If it is greater than 100, we say, you cannot do that. Please don't abuse our generosity. If the number of times is less than zero, we say, you are a bozo. If the number is greater than 1,000, we say, I don't know who you think you are. You are out of control. So this is a function. You can see different basic elements, for loops, ifs, else ifs, ands really get that procedural language capability. So we're going to call it three times, once with 42, which is right you are, once with 200, which should come in to the first error message saying you can't do that, and 5,000 saying, uh, let's see, one of these funny errors. So let's try it. The way we're going to execute it is directly from the file. So we'll say plp sql minus f, plpg sql, We'll execute it in the Postgres database. Right, you are, you cannot do that. You cannot do that, don't abuse our generosity. So that's how you run procedural language in PLPG SQL with um, Greenplum. Now the second example is gonna be PL Python. So why Python? There are so many things you can do with Python. Um, you can import any library from the world of Python into your code and execute that in the server side, not only to process your results, but you could execute it across the rows of your data in parallel processing. So you can imagine hundreds of systems out there running one Greenplum query, all running your Python in parallel. It, it dispatches and executes for you. So here's a simple taste of the power of what you can do. We're going to create a function called PyHead. We take in one text parameter. We return one text parameter. And all we do is we use some very simple Python syntax to take a string and do a slice of that string, take the first four characters or five characters, whatever that is in Python syntax, put it in a new variable and return it. Then we're going to do a select query from the PG class table that lists all the tables in the catalog. We're going to take out the, the table name, the rel name. And then we're going to call our PL our pi head function on that same column. So for every row, we're going to execute this function. And imagine you have a huge table of billions of rows. We can be doing that in parallel, executing on every row across the whole cluster, you know, thousands of CPU cores. So let's run this. So we'll execute the PL Python. And you could see basically here we return the table name and then the, the head of the string, which was parsed with Python. So you could do any kind of natural language syntaxing, machine learning, any kind of advanced Python can be done on the GP cluster um, and using native Python code. That's just a small taste in the analytical capability of what you can do with Greenplum, but I hope it gets you excited about the opportunity. All right, so this is Ivan here. I'm back for you with the wrap up. I think we had a very good tutorial for beginners with Greenplum. You've seen 
where to get green plum what is green plum what the green plum architecture is how to log into green plum how to monitor green plum how to write some functional code with green plum i hope that you are extremely pumped up you're ready to go to some advanced lessons and really see how the power of green plum can be used in your organization to drive business results and to analyze data at extremely large scale with um, with extremely high performance and fidelity and that you can really um, get the get the value out of it and, and get the results that that your business expects and that you guys can, can achieve with this technology so until next time take care and go use green plum